different from last time. I feel like I'm up in the clouds. <laughs> uh, two things I'd want to share, I think they go with what I'm, my message today, and that is Bree and Ryan and what they're doing with our youth, or I'm sorry, young adults. Um, if you're 10 years younger than me, then you're youth. Um, <laughs> Praise God, we have y'all. God has really blessed us that you're in this church and you're part of New Covenant, and I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And then also for, uh, for Cindy and Debbie. Um, they actually taught the children in this church the armor of God. And what a blessing that is that we have Cindy and Debbie, and they're teaching our youth. So I, I, I can't find anything negative that's happening in our church. Everything is positive. God's hands on us. And we just ought to continually praise God for where we're heading as a new church Amen. and as the body of Christ. So today's message, and I'm going to start with a question, and it goes like this. Why would we be interested in or listen to non-believers or the world in general when it comes to how we worship God? Why would we care what the world thinks when we, how we worship God? Our only source of how to worship God, and his son is his word, and that's this book right here, the Bible. We must, must all acknowledge that only Jesus and his word sustains and grows his church and grows us individually. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and it's actually titled, Do Not Love the World. It says, Do Not Love the World, nor the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For if all that is in the world, and the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. The one who does the will of God and does not love the world lives forever. There's our promise. I have a commentary from a pastor, Chuck Smith. He wrote, uh, The Man God Uses, 14 Characteristics of a Godly Man, and it's a book that I've been reading quite a bit lately. And he gets to the point about the softening of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what Pastor Chuck says. He says, There's a common tendency today, especially among the intellectually elite, the smart people, to challenge the Word of God rather than believe it. Unfortunately, seminaries are constantly disputing the inerrancy of God's Word instead of discovering what God's words communicated to them through His Word. The results of this behavior is the growth of liberalism among the pulpits across the United States of America. God's Word, the truth, has been replaced with a lukewarm social gospel. But Paul writes about that in 2 Timothy, and this is what Paul has to say. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for the teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. Teaching, for rebuke, for correction, and training in righteousness. This scripture is actually part of our church beliefs. It's written on that's what we believe. We believe in the inerrancy of God. This is God's word, as it should be. And a biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God, this book. When you believe in the Bible is entirely true, then you will allow it to be the foundation of everything that you say and do. A biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. When you believe the Bible, it's entirely true, then you allow it to be the foundation of everything you say and do. Amen. And then in Romans 2, Romans 12 2, Paul writes this, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the newing of the mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Do not be conformed by the world. If we're being continually transformed by the renewing of our minds, the more Christ-like we become. At that point, 
We come to desire it's God's will in our lives and not the world's. That's when we understand what's truly good for us, and we turn away from the world and what it's been tempting to entice us with. We turn away from what the world is trying to entice us with. And here's a key point. Satan attacks us through our minds to convince us that this isn't true. What God's word says isn't true. He uses doubt. He uses anger. He uses confusion. He uses anxiety. And he will use any other emotion he can find in you to take and make you think this word isn't true and that it does not apply to you. And we have to be as church, as a church, as Christians, we have to be on God constantly that that doesn't happen to us. Now, a world or secular view doesn't believe God exists. They have no understanding at all of the will of God. Many people in the world today live in this selfish and fallen world where the desires of the flesh control their lives. Where the desires of the flesh control their lives. And they often end up incorporating these desires into their personal lives and their, their view on the world. I think you'll agree with this statement. Satan uses television, film, newspapers, music, magazines, books, and even academia to bombard us with anti-God values and beliefs. And these attacks are constant and daily upon us. All you gotta do is turn on the news. Oh, and I almost left one out. He will use the pulpit if the church lets him. That's why we have to be on God and know God's word. And as Christians, we have a very big fight on our hands because what did Jesus command us? He said, go out and make disciples of everyone, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was quite a command he gave us. So what's Satan going to do? He's going to come after us for that. Share something personal with you. My older brother went off to college in 1974. And after his first semester was over with, he came home for Christmas break. And he informed my mom in a very belligerent way and said, God didn't create the world. There is no God. It was all evolution. That was 50 years ago. Now, has anything changed or has it gotten worse? If we look at what's going on in the colleges today, it's, it's very evident that it may have gotten worse. He died alone in Pine, Idaho, eight years ago on a Christmas Eve morning. He either died of a heart attack or due to the complications of a heart attack when he froze to death. It'd be three days before they found him in his Jeep. He wasn't a Christian, and his beliefs leaned towards being atheist. And he was my big brother. Many people in the world today don't demonstrate the love, the compassion, the obedience, humility, or priorities of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I think one of the primary reasons for this is one, they don't think like Jesus, they don't know who Jesus is, and for many of them, they don't even care who Jesus is. But then Jesus tells us in John 15, 18, all about that. I realize today I need more of these. There's not enough of these when you do a lot of scripture. If the world hates you, you know that it was it has hated me before it hated you. If you were the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. We're not going to be popular with the world. Jesus comes to those who desire and long for a relationship with him, but it can come with a cost. You can be despised, you can be hated, as the scripture says. Even family members can turn against you. If you don't accept their worldly ways, their views, their lifestyle. As a Christian, just because I don't believe with somebody's 
lifestyle or view. It doesn't make me intolerant. It doesn't make me a hater. You know, we made a decision in our lives a long time ago that God's word is what we're going to live by. And that's what we do. We live by it. So with it comes the cost. But it's hard not to get defensive when you're attacked or falsely accused. But we're humans and that happens. And that's when you have to go back to the word and pray so that you don't end up acting like those in the world. Because Jesus expects a great deal from us. And he should. He went to the cross for us. He took our sin. He took my sin. How can I ever give him enough thanks for that? John Wesley shared his concerns with the church holding to God's word in 1786. A couple hundred years ago, John Wesley was worried about the church. I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist in Europe or America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast to the doctrine, the spirit, and the discipline which comes when we first set out as a church. Doctrine, spirit, and discipline. As Christians, we either follow God's word and be led by the Spirit, or we could drift away as John Wesley feared. And you know, sadly, today many denominations have lost sight of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And because of that way of thinking, they're shrinking. Present-day churches live in this age of compromise. And the gospel of Jesus has put, up, put on the back burner so that the church can be accepted in the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been put on the back burner so that we can be loved by the world. I'd rather be loved by Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been watered down to make it palatable for the masses. And many, sadly, many churches in the world today want that. But as a newly formed church, we must be on guard at all times, especially here at New Covenant Methodist Church. We must wear our armor of God at all times. And I think we're on the right path to that because Cindy and Debbie are teaching our kids that now. The armor of God. But as a church, we also have to have our armor on. Nowadays, sin and unrighteousness all seem normal in the world. And righteousness seems strange, if not wrong. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I think we see that, don't we, every time we turn on the TV? Evil, evil's good and good's bad. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. You're either in God's light or you're not, or you're in the darkness. There's no in-between. And we have to stand firm on God's word at all times. But then there's this tremendous pressure on Christians in the church to give in to the spirit of the age, as it's called, which refers to certain attitudes or values in our society. Spirit of age refers to certain attitudes or values in our society. We'll hear people say, well, God's word's outdated. The times have changed. Scripture comes across as even harsh, and some of my brothers on Wednesday night have heard that before in, in the past year. You know, it's, it's a little bit harsh. Well, just follow. Do what it tells you to do. Be obedient. Quit worrying about whether it's a little tough to follow. David Platt makes a statement in his book, Counterculture. That's another book that Brother Mark has shared with me over the years. Um, he's making my library grow quite big and just sharing. Uh, I've got to find more room. David Platt says this, and it goes along with Isaiah 520. It says, as a good judge, 
God is outraged by injustice. He attests those who say to the wicked, you're good, and to those who are good, you're wicked. As present-day followers of Jesus Christ, as a church, as a body of Christ, we need to face the reality that contemporary American culture is an increasingly anti-Christian. Again, all you got to do is turn on your TV and you won't see it. But who feeds this compromise? Who's behind the worldview? The attack on the Bible? Satan. He's feeding those lies and people are listening. And I've mentioned this before. He hates God. He hates Jesus. And he wants our soul. Because every time he gets one of us, he can go there and just point a finger and laugh at God. Because he, he just has this desire to hate. And what's God? Love. And God wants all of us with him. But we have to make that decision. In John 8... 43 through 45, Jesus doesn't mince words about Satan or confronting religious leaders who will not stand to hear the truth of God and the truth of his words. And he, this is what Jesus has to say. He says, why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand for the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own resources and he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Now, if Jesus says it, don't you think we ought to believe it? We ought to be listening and have ears to hear and then to be obedient to what, he, to what he tells us. Paul gives us a strong warning in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. <clears throat> Timothy was blessed to have someone like Paul to constantly write to him and instruct in him. And this is what he says to Timothy. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and with great patience and instruction. And now here's verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance of their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside the myths. Tickled ears. Tickled ears. I hope we never, I don't think we will. I believe this is one godly church and one powerful church for God. And you, I bet you can guess he don't like us. I bet Satan don't like us, but he better get used to it. When doctrine is crafted by human desires and not by God, that's when tensions in the church arise. The body of Christ, the church should follow God's word, not man. We should follow God's word and not man. And if we don't completely trust this word, then why are we even sitting here? God is the author of all scripture and cannot lie, and so we know that his word is true. His word is the ultimate authority in our lives. His word is the ultimate authority in our lives. Over the years, I've heard quite a few sayings from different people, both young and old. Um, I'm a good person. I still haven't figured out what that one means. Um, I don't need the guilt of religion. Well, Jesus saved me. I don't have any guilt. There is no God because how could a God allow such misery and suffering in the world? God didn't cause it. Man did. He disobeyed him. Rebelled against him. And then this one. I don't need to be judged by anyone. I don't want anybody to judge me. And I think this last statement is the most telling. Is it ignorance of understanding who is going to judge us? An atheist doesn't believe in God or his son. But they're going to meet Jesus one day and they're going to meet him on bended knee. 
just as we all are. And that's a guaranteed fact. My brother found that out the hard way when he died eight years ago. And it breaks my heart. Because I love him. And I'm never going to see him again. Because he chose a different route than I chose. And that's heartbreaking. God's judgment isn't about being mean, and we've heard this, I'm sure, mean or a bully. God isn't those things. He's the exact opposite. But God does bring discipline and judgment and wrath on those who are slaves to sin and, and rebel against him. And even this discipline, though, is based on love. He does love us. He proved it. He sent his son, didn't he? Jesus went to the cross for us. In Hebrews 12, 6, it's just a short sentence, but for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son whom he receives. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. A.W. Tozer made this comment, and I think it speaks volumes, of those wishful thinking, if not misguided at best, and this is what Tozer says. He says, the vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the conscience of millions. The vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the conscience of millions. We're told by misguided, if not veiled church leaders that Jesus loves us and that's all that matters. And yeah, Jesus does love us. He proved it on the cross. He laid down his life. But it does matter how we live our lives, what we believe, and how we worship. When you're persecuted for your faith, rejoice that you've been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. He suffered for us, and so as his followers, shouldn't we suffer at times? And remember that when trials come, they will refine our faith and build us spiritually. When the trials come, and they're going to come, it's life will be refined and will grow spiritually. And as Christians, we have to stand firm on our biblical beliefs when others turn away their ears, their hearts, and their minds from the truth. We have to stand strong. And so one of my last scriptures today, uh, y'all have heard it many times. The men have heard it continuously over the last several months or more, thanks to Brother Mark. It's Ephesians 6, and I'm not picking on my brother Mark because I love him dearly, and he's a godly man, and he's such a blessing. But Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of against the powers, against the forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of weakness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm. And so our church body, this body of Christ that we are, must stand firm on God's word and not what the world wants or believes. I believe God's getting tired of these churches that are caving in to the world. But we should never waver in our beliefs or attempt to appease the world. I have one last little sentence here. Teresa brought this to my attention this week. If God's word tells you what a sin is, our opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> Because it's God's word. So I thank you, my brothers and sisters. It's always an honor and a blessing to come and share with y'all. I just praise God every day in thinking that I can do this and be a part of this church with you. It, it means everything to me, and I just love you dearly. So thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen.